Oh, awesome. Looks like we bundled out. Um, so I guess I'll just start. My name is Danielle, Danielle Davis. I'm with RAC and I'm helping to host this meeting um, with Salvador. And so I'm working behind the scenes to try and keep up with questions and chat and all that stuff. Um, I request that if you have questions to post them in the Q&A section. Um, and I will try to answer what I can behind the scenes as we go along. Um, and then at the end, we will also have a Q&A um, session. So if we don't answer your question, um, you can always ask it at the end and it will address it. Um, just thank you for coming. And I said I was at RAC, I'm the registrar. So I um, help take care of the collection. I keep track of everything. And when new artwork like this comes into the collection, I, um, I catalog it, I take photos of it, I do all that stuff. And, I'm here helping Sal. Um, I think that's about it. Sal, can I kick it to you? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, welcome all and thank you, Danielle, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for being in this space with us on a sunny Wednesday, late afternoon, early evening day. Um, we are really excited to be talking about this project. Um, and we have some folks here that also will be able to help uh, give us more insight into it. But um, before we begin, I just wanna um, say we have our ASL interpreters here. Um, thank you both for being here, Rachel and Janice, I believe. Um, thank you both for being here. And of course, Danielle, thank you for facilitating. Um, I'm gonna be bringing up a PowerPoint uh, that will just be sort of outlining the process, more information about this. Um, and then at the end, we'll be doing a QA and a and we're hoping to leave at least 15 minutes worth of time to do that. Um, if you put your questions in the Q&A chat, both Danielle and I will be monitoring it. And if we can answer there, we will. Otherwise, we'll bring it up at the very end of um, our time together. So... Uh, with that being said, let me share my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. And actually, we're going to do this. So here we are again, welcome everyone to this. This opportunity is the Behavioral Health Resource Center. And particularly, as you can see there in the green with artwork here, we're looking at the first floor uh, uh, common wall, um, which is in the common area of um, the center. Let's see. So here's just in our agenda. Um, we, other, we have other RAC staff present with us. Um, so, uh, and then Danielle like works in with me in public art uh, as a registrar. I'm a project manager. Um, we are here to help guide the process for folks as they uh, go through the application processes. Uh, both Danielle and I are folks you could reach out to if you have any questions about the portal. You can reach out to me specifically if you have questions about the call. I've received a number of inquiries already. Um, so yeah, we just want to make sure that this is as, um, however we can help you understand, um, and as well as um, navigating both the process as well as that application portal, which we'll talk a little bit here in a bit too. Um, Let's see, we'll, we'll talk about uh, RAC, um, definitely get into the call, the trauma-informed design guidelines, um, our art goal and opportunity, eligibility, the portal, and like I said, that Q&A at the end there. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we have um, our two ASL interpreters. Oh, Danielle, the um, live captioning, uh, putting that on. Bear with us. This is the first time we've ever worked in um, webinar status. Uh, we're continuously evolving and growing in our um, accessibility work. Um, so we appreciate your patience as we 
we're, we're trying to do the, our best we can. Um, uh, but as it says here, we also offer technical assistance, navigating the application portal or preparing attachments. Um, in the application, or I should say the um, request for qualifications, the call for artists, there is a video link uh, that you can go to where I actually run through with folks how to access the portal and how you would set up your account and register. Um, and then we've also offered in the application materials a spot for folks who don't feel like, um, feel, you know, if you'd rather not write um, in your statement of interest, write it down and feel more comfortable with maybe talking um, or sharing a video, we've included an upload um, section for that audio or video um, uh, as a response to the statement of interest. So we are expanding um, uh, what accessibility looks like in the application process. And I really thank the county for helping guide that work too with us in this. Um, we do translation of materials of our applications. So feel free to reach out to us as well for that if needed. We do large print materials and materials in alternative formats. Um, again, interpretation services. And uh, we also um, process accommodations for people with disabilities. Um, so again, feel free to reach out to us and we'll do our best to um, address it. So this is the Regional Arts and Culture Council. That's where I'm representing on behalf, both Danielle are part of the organization. And I just wanna do a quick introduction of that. Um, so the Regional Arts and Culture Council is a nonprofit organization that actually used to be a city and county um, department years ago. Um, we've been a uh, nonprofit now for 27 years. This is our 27th year, believe it or not. Um, and what we've done is we, when we moved from that governmental entity to that nonprofit entity, we actually contracted right back with the city and the county to be uh, the steward of their arts investments. And that includes a number of things like, as you see here, grants. Um, we do offer uh, grants to um, artists, individual artists, as well as arts organizations. Um, we do um, work around arts education. Um, we also offer a number of resources, resources including workshops, uh, professional development workshops in particular, or we have also been a convener and gatherer. We're moving into advocacy work, especially in the last few years. Um, and then of course, public art, which is part of what I'll talk about right now. Um, so as I said, we no offer a number of things, um, public art programming, um, and I should say with all of that that I mentioned, uh, RAC, RAC advocates for equity, inclusion, and access, uh, DEIA is really important to us um, and wanting to make sure that opportunities and just as like the artwork is in all areas of the city, um, that the opportunity to have um, artists participating from all those communities as well be represented in our collection. Um, so public art, um, we are we do a lot of programming. Um, Percent for Art programs uh, is our biggest uh, program. I'm sorry if you hear noise. Someone's decided at this time to start drilling something. <laughs> Some of the challenges of working from home still. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but um, yeah, we do. Uh, Percent for Art is the biggest program. And basically that is an ordinance um, that the capital construction projects for the city and county, 2% um, of that budget goes towards artwork, which is actually what we've got going on here with the Behavioral Health Resource Center. Um, it funds all, most of our programming, including temporary artworks. Uh, we have, uh, we just finished um, a call for portable works where we purchased, we're purchasing uh, directly 2D works that will be traveling between um, city and county spaces. Um, that also includes a visual chronicle, which is a collection that's focused primarily, um, or I should say solely on um, Portland, uh, the essence of Portland, whatever that means. Um, it changes with our themes each time we release it. We also offered two years ago in the midst of the pandemic uh, support theme, which 
was um, a program that offered uh, artists um, funding to continue their art practice. Um, we've also been working with PBOT on an initiative called Black Portland Matters, Art in Placemaking, um, where we are working directly with Black-led organizations to create public art programming um, with Black communities and Black artists. Um, and that's been work that's been ongoing now for two years as well as a number of other organizations that we collaborate with in the community and also the Public Art Murals program, which I oversee. Um, yeah. So all of that being said, um, here we are to our call for today, which is the Behavioral Health Resource Center. I, I'm gonna share a little bit about this, but I also wanna take this moment to introduce another person into the conversation. Krista Jones, who is uh, representing the county tonight. Krista, do you mind just introducing yourself? Absolutely, and I bring my wonderful partner, Lynn Smith-Stott, here with me as well. Um, and so I will go ahead and get started and then hand it over to you, Lynn. Um, my name is Krista Jones, I use she, her, hers. I am the Senior Manager of the Community Mental Health Program at Multnomah County in the Behavioral Health Division. What that means is that I support um, uh, multiple programs and contracts that provide services to the most vulnerable in our community. Um, so uh, speaking to those with severe and persistent mental illness, um, and all of the intersecting kind of issues that come along with that, with that kind of chronic um, uh, need for services and supports. And so our, our clients and those we serve um, really have a lot of um, experience with houselessness, with hospitalizations, with, um, with criminal and legal exposure. And um, so this project um, that I've been working on with our team for about three and a half years um, is very near and dear to my heart because it provides an opportunity and a resource for these individuals that we work with every day. Um, so I'll get into more about that later, but uh, Lynn, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Lynn smith Dodd, and I'm the supervisor for the Office of Consumer Engagement. I use she, her pronouns. And what my office does is uh, attempt to listen and represent the voices of the people we serve. I'm there because of my own challenges with addiction and mental health recovery. And I want to give credit to DeAndre Kenyon Jewey, who is my teammate, who would have liked to have been here tonight, but uh, asked me to fill in at the last minute due to illness. So. He's been really instrumental in, in bringing this work to the forefront. So thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, well, let's just make this a conversation as we go through here. Um, so here, I just wanted to give folks, first of all, the picture that the image that you're seeing is a picture of the site. Uh, this is a rendering. The building is actually something that was purchased by the county. So it's already existing and it's being renovated right now. It's at the corner of Southwest Oak and Southwest Park Avenue next to new avenues for youth. Um, the county is planning a trauma-informed peer supported center um, as Krista had mentioned, and as well as Lynn, uh, working closely with people with lived experience, uh, health providers, and of course that local community right there in downtown. Um, it will consist of a day center, which will occupy the first two floors, as well as short-term um, shelter and longer-term transitional housing on the upper floors. Um, and I believe it's about five floors in total. Is that right, Krista? Okay. Four and a half. <laughs> Four and a half. Okay, got it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and um, the day center is a community space to really gather, um, get resources, experience, experience connection with peers and providers of all types, and then accessing also basic services like um, basic needs as showers, laundry. Um, I, I would also, um, I'd invite either Lynn or Krista to talk about this because I think there is initially, um, there was, I think some inquiry that we received when the call went out is like, is this a treatment center? But this is not a treatment center, this is different. And so I wonder if one of you can speak to just like why also too that there's visibility um, on that ground floor and just the, the intention in the both architectural design and what folks hope that this space can be. Lynn, do you want me to take this one? <laughs> Chime in whenever. Yeah, feel free to start off and I'll be happy to add to anything. Wonderful. Um, one of the concepts that uh, came to my mind early on was that the intention of this uh, program and series of programs is to help and not hide. 
Um, and I think too often um, we have experiences in our community where individuals who really need the, the most care, the most treatment um, are, are kind of shuffled away into the shadows. And um, we really wanted uh, the BHRC to be a different experience for those individuals. Um, we also are very much aware that from a trauma-informed perspective, um, trust is not assumed. Uh, trust has to be, and it has to be built through relationships. And one of the ways that we envision building uh, trust is through the design of this building. So you can see both in terms of how you can see through the, the fence of the plaza, that it's intentionally designed to be able to see through uh, so that folks who are curious and folks who may uh, be a little bit hesitant to come into the space can kind of see the activity happening. The same is true you um, can see on that first floor. Uh, we thought of that first floor as um, kind of a cafe and living room setting, uh, recognizing that there are gonna be individuals, participants, um, future participants who will walk by and, um, and wonder, is this the right place for me? Um, and so by creating that visibility, um, we are creating a, a, an access point for that trust building. Um, and Lynn, I'm gonna fill, fill it. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. I, I would just add that um, in terms of the question of, well, if this isn't a treatment program, then what is it? Um, we really have a very different model that is driven by people who have lived experience. Uh, most clinical models, I, I worked as a clinician for a number of years, are, are led by our uh, best assumptions about what people need as opposed to really asking and listening and, and providing. Um, so this intends to meet people where they're at. And if they just need a space to sit down and have a cup of coffee and enjoy the art, then that's what we want to provide. And if, as they get to know us, they want connections to the treatment, we can partner with them and make that happen too. And we can do everything in between. But I'm really excited to have art that supports the kind of welcome that we want to create for a diverse group of people who have experienced a lot of trauma in their lives and, and need a place where they can connect. Thanks. Thank you both for sharing that. I think that context is really helpful um, for folks to understand the value of this artwork um, and also why the, how it relates to the value of the intention being set in the center. Um, uh, again, I'm just to say the last point here, as both Krista and Lynn had mentioned, upholding values like safety, trust and belonging, and then creating that space um, for folks to catch their breaths, be relaxed, focus, um, refocus. Um, let's see here. So part of that intention to do those very things has also been how the county, the Pierce um, group, uh, have been really looking at um, outfitting the building with trauma-informed design guidelines. Um, and so this is a big part of also what I think this artwork we're looking for, as well as all the artwork that goes into the center. Um, and so as you see here, um, that means using color schemes that emphasize cool colors, um, greens, blues, purples, and avoiding some of those deeply warm hues, um, such as like red, oranges, and yellows, um, to avoid arousing negative emotions. Um, uh, distracting patterns on walls, uh, abstract work that could be triggering to some people, I think is also something we're trying to avoid here. Um, uh, avoiding art conveying uh, meaning or symbolic significance that again would generate something negative. Um, so just being mindful with imagery, I think, is a big part of this. Um, obviously, things like, you know, nature, so landscape paintings, photography that um, highlights nature, those are something that we've discussed as possibly being um, as artwork that could potentially be in the space, as imagery that could potentially be in the space. I wouldn't say necessarily that it, we're only saying that that's what we're looking for, but it definitely is something that could be. Um, and again, as part of that is ultimately, I think, increasing um, positive feelings, right? Arousing positive feelings and trying to really stray away from something that might be um, 
uh, negative or or harmful um, for folks as they're trying to, again, collectively like pull them, uh, gather themselves in that space for that comfort, for that refocus, for that catching of breath. Um, I, I don't know, Krista and Lynn, do you have anything to add to that as well? I would I would just add, uh, add one thing. Um, I don't want to make assumptions about anyone on this call, but statistically speaking, I'm not the only one here with mental health and addiction challenges, statistically speaking. And so I would encourage people, if they do have their own personal experiences and things that have been meaningful to them and wherever they are on their path of, of the wellness that we all deserve, uh, tap into some of that. What, uh, what has been helpful and meaningful to you? Because the more authentic you are, the more likely uh, that work will connect with others. Thanks. And I, so Lynn, that was so well said. That that's amazing. Yes, thank you. I totally agree with that. And I also want to just note that pets are also welcome in this space. And I think that's an important piece of kind of thinking about the individuals who will be using this space that they, um, you know, that they might have a, a tool or strategy or a mechanism through their animal or through other things that 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 bring that bring comfort and that bring a sense of, of peace and safety. So I think that it's really important to kind of not think so much as like, oh, these are limiting factors, but more of like, okay, these are considerations. And to Lynn's point, kind of that tapping into your own experience, I think will create um, a product that's meaningful and, and, and wonderful and, and really aligned with the space. Thank you both for saying that. Yeah, that is helpful. Um, and there's a lot of, I can just say, I've received a lot of curiosity around that too. Um, here are just some more imagery of, again, not to say this is exactly what we're looking for, but just, you know, sort of in the area, um, again, sort of those natural textures, natural feels, again, part of those cool colors. Um, so the art opportunity, here we go. Um, so in the space, again, on that first floor um, is this common wall. And um, so this opportunity actually is part of a larger art plan that I've been working with the county on to have artworks located in primarily highly public zones of the space. Um, so that would include, include this first floor as well as exterior spaces like that huge um, plaza wall that I had shown at the very um, top of, or earlier, I should say. Um, the first floor in the common area of the day center is where this particular wall is at. Um, it's sizable, 26, a little over 26 feet um, wide by 11, a little over 11 feet wide or high height. Sorry, y'all, it's six o'clock. <laughs> My day is like slowly. Ah. Um, you see the you see the numbers there. <laughs> um, we are, what we're asking for particularly in this um, call is a digital design. Um, so we're not looking for a painted on um, artwork. We are looking for an artist to create um, some kind of um, digital file that will be given to a fabricator, which I'm, we're, we've identified already, who will be printing um, and onto that sort of, it's almost like a wallpaper um, that will be applied and then installing that on that wall. Um, so I've had questions also around if folks, you know, there's a couple ways in which we can get to that digital design. Like if folks work primarily digitally and want to create it there, that's totally fine. I think that's something that we can do. And then there are those that are working in more 2D work, you know, traditional 2D work, um, collages, paintings, um, even textiles. And I would say like, if that's the case, that's also fine as well. And then what we would do is we would have it photograph um, at a real high uh, quality and then turn it into a digital file that could be scaled up. Um, and we, we know of, um, uh, uh, partners that can help us make that come true as well. So there are a number of ways in which we can go about getting that digital file. Um, and I should say another reason why we've decided to do this, um, sort of have this wallpaper um, versus something that's painted on is because of 
like any space, um, over some, you know, over time, there can be some wear and tear and um, having something that can be um, reprinted and reinstalled fairly easily, um, especially without the artist having to go back to the site, I think is important to us as well. So it's, that's the reason, one of the reasons why we decided to go that route. Um, so eligibility here, um, we are committed in engaging new communities of artists and always looking to expand um, the range of artistic and cultural expression in um, both the city and the county's collections. Um, so I just wanna put that out there. That is very true for all of our projects. For this particular project, in addition, um, we are looking for artists or artist teams that are coming from Oregon and Southwest Washington. Um, we know that there are a lot of uh, folks who live in the Portland metro area that are right in you know, Clark County and some of the other lying um, suburbs. We wanna make sure that folks have that um, opportunity to participate also. Um, and then we, uh, we've talked both with the county and with the panel that's going to be reviewing the project that we are prior to prioritizing artists who have experiences with houselessness, substance use and or mental health challenges. Um, they will be prioritized and you know, I, I, I do think that, that when we say that too, we do mean folks who have personal experience. And then we do know, I know of a lot of artists who also are working in spaces or have maybe family or friends that have, um, that are part of these communities. And so I would say, if that's the case um, and you feel comfortable, please share that with us because I don't think that necessarily precludes one from applying. Um, we ultimately what we're looking at is how does one's artwork um, or um, practice interact with the, the the values of the center and ultimately right the populations that are a part of it. Um, that's what we're trying to understand. Um, the project budget is fifteen to twenty thousand, and that includes um, all expenses such as the artist fee. Um, their design time, um, the work of creating a digital file, and then working with third-party contractors who will help us um, get to that, um, both the uh, printing and installing, as well as if we need some folks to help us digitize it, that as well. Um, so that is, yeah, that's what this budget is. It We are not looking for an artist, and the budget doesn't include for the artist to do that work on their own. Again, they're just delivering a digital file that at that point, I will be working with third party contractors in the county to um, make the rest of it happen. Um, but obviously with some guidance from the artists um, through that process. So the portal, um, we have, uh, RAC has an opportunity portal that um, is pretty much where all of our, both public art calls as well as our grant opportunities exist. Um, for this particular project, we are looking um, at up to eight uh, images of past work samples. Uh, there's a space for folks to include descriptions, um, uh, as well as we are looking for a statement of interest. And in the call, we have actually outlined um, a few questions or that we would like responses to. So addressing those um, directly is really important. I would say for many artists, like this is your, this is your like first impression that you're making with the panel. So think of that, like, let's say this is a group of folks that may not know your work. What would you like to be, how would you like yourself to be represented then um, to make yourself, um, to leave that impression, to make yourself known? So think of both the artwork samples as well as that statement of interest as like that opportunity. Um, if you don't have, I just wanna make the note, if you don't have a professional artist website, you can link your social media. I know many artists um, use Instagram for that, which is great. Um, so that is totally fine. Um, I just wanted to bring this up here. Just a slide of what the opportunity portal looks like when you get to it. Again, in the call, there is a video. Um, it's short, four minutes, where I go through exactly how to register if you've never interacted with the portal before. It's pretty easy. Um, and if you have any questions still, please feel free to reach out. We can help navigate that process. So the deadline to apply is uh, 
the 20th Wednesday of this month at 5 p.m. Um, that's the website address to the portal, rack.org slash apply. Um, I would say additional tips would be ask, again, ask questions as they are coming up. Feel free to reach out to myself and Danielle. Um, the other thing I would say to Art is don't wait till the last minute to apply. You don't want that pressure on yourself to try to get everything through and, you know, inevitably like, oh, there's snafus and, you know, technology or, ah, oh, I'm trying to bring this file in and try to give yourself that space um, where you don't feel that intense pressure. Um, and then, yeah, if there are any problems navigating that, um, let us know. Again, I can't say that enough. We will help navigate for sure. Selection process, uh, as I did mention a panel and that's actually the body uh, that will be reviewing the applications and making the decision. Um, that does include county representatives. Krista, for example, is on that uh, panel, as well as this artwork from Valerie Yeo, um, who's in her collection, who's also part of the panel. So it includes representatives from the project, it includes artists um, of various backgrounds um, that will be taking a look at these applications. And then ultimately the panel will be selecting and making their choice based on the ability, the artist's ability to demonstrate um, a couple of things, originality of vision, um, relationship to the goals that have been outlined for the center, um, as well as the work's overall suitability for public display, display, especially I would say in relationship to the trauma-informed design guidelines in this space. Um, uh, and so, yeah, and, and just again, that tip, your statement of interest and your images are what is um, gonna help uh, elucidate and what, what you're trying to bring and how you, your, you might be relevant for this project. So try to be very clear and of course, authentic. Um, yeah. So process and timeline, um, again, Wednesday, April 20th is our deadline. And then the panel will begin looking at all of those applications right after and making their decisions um, in May, June. Our hope is that the artists will be on board working on the design by the summer, um, in the middle of the summer. And then um, the review of the design will go before the panel in early September is our hope with the installation of the artwork. That means the printing and the installing taking place no later than um, end of October. Um, the center will also be opening Krista and Lynn, right in, I know there's a fall um, and I think October is what I heard. What October, we're... November, okay. fall, <laughs> yeah. Got it, I, we work all the time in public art with those, those generalities to some degree. So I appreciate it, yeah. So that's also why this timeline, that's what's informing this timeline. Um, so I would also say to make sure that you have availability to, to work in that timeline is gonna be also key when we are looking at applicants. Um, yeah, and if there are any other questions about the overall opportunity, feel free to reach out. Uh, here's my email address. We can also write it in the Q&A. Um, I see a number of questions popping up in the Q&A um, and the, I'm sure stuff in the chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing, Danielle. And yeah. I, um, I'm not typing fast enough, so I'm just going to read them out. <laughs> um, so there's a couple about kind of trauma-informed design. One came up in the chat as well, um, but I'll start here. Do the trauma-informed design guidelines allow for the limited presence of warmer colors as part of a color palette that still emphasizes cooler, less saturated colors? I think so. I think so. I Again, I don't think it uh, the, the guidelines are just that, right? They're, they're help to gu guide, um, but not necessarily preclude. So I, I do think that, yeah. And it, Krista, it sounds like, yes. Okay, great. great. Um, oh gosh, there's so many. Oh, let's get through <laughs> Sorry, let's there's through just so much here. Okay. Um, what are the potential limitations as far as contrast, shapes, and content to assure that the art is not triggering? 
Um, and what suggestions do you have for artists to make trauma-informed work um, that also follows classical design aesthetics? Oh, that's a lot. You, that's a lot. I, well, I can say, at least to the last part, we have um, a colleague of mine has uh, generously created some resources um, around trauma-informed design. And so we can also offer that up um, for folks who just are looking for further clarification. What was the first part of that question, Danielle? Um, oh, 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 scroll up. What are the potential limitations as far as contrast, shapes, and content to ensure the art is not triggering? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say this much. I, I don't know, an, you know, I, whenever an artist gets selected for a project, there is definitely collaboration between what the artist is thinking um, and having dialogue with the project team, which would include the county representatives. So I, you know, I think that's really where it starts. And at that point, we can have, we can let folks know, like if this is maybe the an artist will let us know, this is the direction I want to go. The county uh, representatives are already there being like, ah not or me you know so like there's a level of dialogue that happens at that point and then I would also say you know that's one of the reasons why the panel also reviews the design they give feedback so again if let's say there's nothing that's come up so far and then you know the artist presents their design that's also another opportunity in which again if this is not the direction that makes sense there can be feedback given to the artist to let them know oh you might want to reconsider this or you know um, again, we, we try not to, I, I should say, we definitely don't want to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking here, um, basically like, you know, um, tell artists exactly what they should do, but I, again, I think this group is really here in a collaborative and helpful way to help guide um, for all of us to get the best result for what makes sense in the space. I, 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 yeah, and again, Krista and Lynn, feel free to answer and add additional if you feel like anything's here that I'm missing. Oh, Lynn, yeah. Uh, this is partly because I had an equity training today, but we were talking about intent and impact. And I sort of think that may apply as I think about artistic technique and, and skill, which I know nothing about. So I think about the artist's intent and then as the artist is doing their best work, thinking about what that impact will be. And while I don't know much uh, about technique, uh, my wife is an artist and she, she can explain all that stuff to me. And still at the end of that conversation, what I really know is how I feel when I look at uh, the art that she's explaining to me. So I don't know if that, if that helps or not, but it's how you feel in the end. Mm, I appreciate that, Lynn. And I would also say, again, this is why we have a panel, because we've got a, we're collecting a diversity of opinions, right, um, that can help um, respond and offer feedback. So uh, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a question here more about uh, fabrication, um, and it's actually three questions. Okay. Um, Will the final printed installation have UV protection? And I assume the answer is yes. Yeah, uh, yes, since the daylight, yeah, this, it's openly exposed. Um, yeah, we can talk to our fabricator about that. Yeah. Um, and will there be artist proofs beforehand to determine if the printed colors are true to the original work file? Yes, that is something that we have done and we will do. That's part of that. Um, part of that uh, budget scope of work, yes. Um, and the last question in that was what uh, digital format will be required? And I, I'm assuming that's to the actual artwork, but also my thought was, oh, in the application, we want a JPEG. <laughs> that's where yeah. my mind went, but in the final artwork, I believe is what. Yeah, and I think that's really, a, that's a conversation. I mean, it depends on um, what our fabricator wants. Um, and we can, we'll talk to them and, and have them share that with the artist beforehand for sure. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, uh, for the art, yeah, for the application, we're looking for JPEGs. However, we also have added um, 
the acts, the ability that if an artist just wants to upload a video of the artwork, they can do that as well. Um, so yeah, but I, ideally I would say just JPEGs seem to work better um, when reviewing lots of artwork, um, but there is a video option as well. Right. Um, and there was another, another question, sort of in that vein, um, what is the best way to highlight our personal experiences with houselessness, et cetera, in the application? That's, I would say that's the statement of interest area. That's where we're really looking to, um, if again, as folks feel comfortable, but letting us know how that, that experience. And again, I think it goes back to the, one of the prompts which tell us how your work um, relates, engages um, with the values and of the center and also the experiences. Um, so statement of interest is where you wanna uh, really highlight that. And again, if, the, if there's specific artwork samples that come up where that's also um, being reflected, I would use that conceptual information field. That's also another space to capture and share with us in the panel um, that those experiences. Um, another question about the file. How large does the file size need to be to be enlarged enough for the wall? Does it need to be higher than 600 DPI? Um, and personally, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> You know, that's a great question, and I'm going to leave it to the professionals to answer that. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I will, I can tell you, we will know once we get there. Um, and we're talking to our partners in this. Yeah, they yeah. can, they, they will be, they will make sure to um, share that with artists. Yeah. Uh, excellent. And I think that's the last one we had in our q and I'm just looking through my chat here. If anyone has any other questions, just um, stick them in there and we'll read them out. Wow. Um, well, here, I am currently in a substance abuse recovery vocational rehabilitational program, um, which sounds familiar, similar to this. Do you have any suggestions on possible visual motifs that could be useful in creating a successful piece of art. Mm. I'm gonna actually, I'd love to hear some input from Kristen Lynn on this, but I, I do wanna just take this opportunity to say, it, it, we are not asking for proposals in this application process. I just wanna make that very clear. I, we believe strongly that anytime an artist is creating a proposal, they need to be compensated for that work. That is not what we're asking at this point. Um, so I just feel like, just want to make that, yeah, feel like that's important to share. But I would love to hear um, from Kristen Lynn, just maybe your responses to that question. I'm going to jump in, um, Lynn. Oh, unless you want to go first. Lynn. Go ahead, Kristen. I'm happy to follow you. Okay, thank you. I was just really kind of uh, touched by the way that Lynn framed what she said before in terms of the impact versus intent. And I think that when we walk through the space and I was just there yesterday and it's just magic um, to see these walls be going up and to understand the impact that we're gonna have on the lives of, of people that are walking through this space. And I think that if we can make sure that our values are alive in every decision point that we make um, as a community to support um, the individuals who are benefit from this. I, I don't think that we can go wrong. And our values are in just creating a welcoming space. Our values are in recognizing the prevalence of trauma and recognizing that we can take very little steps to make a really big impact on helping someone feel comforted, helping someone feel safer and helping someone feel welcome. And so I think that, you know, not, I, I, I do not want to be overly prescriptive in this process or in my opinions on the panel. I think more, I, I want people, everyone, staff, providers, guests, participants, I want everyone to experience a, a place of, of warmth and a place of welcoming. And if we can insert joy in there while we're at it, I, I would love to see that. I really appreciate your question, Carlos. I, uh, as I thought about it, I was recalling some of the challenges that we had at the county in finding pictures to go with some of our presentations because there is certainly a lot of tragedy that we see on the street every day. 
And at the same time, we want to convey hope, but we want it to be real. And I think that if I saw something that was rainbows and unicorns, it might not speak to me because that might not really reflect the journey that I'm on. So there's a sweet spot there in the journey uh, of moving toward hope. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, two people have asked now um, if they're applying as a team, are they still limited to eight images total for the group? Um, and the answer is yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and I would say, and Danielle, tell me as well what you think, but I, this is where I would say be really mindful of like then what images you're submitting. Um, if you have prior experience working as a team, then I would encourage you to uh, upload images of those collaborations, just so the panel can get a sense of how um, the team already works creatively. Um, and if they aren't, that's fine too. I think part one of the prompts also in the statement of interest is, if you are playing as a team, tell us what the nature of that collaboration will look like. And then I think using the images as a way to uh, represent that collaboration um, is really helpful. Um, so just this very, you know, basic uh, example would be like, if there's an artist that's maybe like more, like creating maybe more of that, like um, the background um, and sort of maybe those kind of flourishes or uh, imagery there, and then the artist is doing the uh, the other artist in the collaboration is doing something maybe that's on the more in the foreground um, with particular imagery. Then using your samples to um, reflect what that looks like, I think, is important. So again, just being mindful, of, like if there are if there are images already of collaboration, I would strongly encourage uploading that. And yet, if there aren't then what are the parts of the collaboration that are gonna be highlighted in the work um, for the panel to see, I think is important. What do you say to that, Danielle? Anything I'm missing there? No, you got it. Um, I see another question that's come up about colors and things being triggering. Um, are vibrant colors potentially triggering because the, the palette that we've seen so far is very pastel and mellow. Um, is there anything more to say about that? I mean, oh, Krista, go for it. Yeah. I was just thinking that, you know, the where we have learned and the intention for this entire program has been to involve um, individuals who, with lived experience and, and consumers in the process from the start. And that is really uh, relevant, I think, to that question because what we have done with that is that when we have a decision point, we lean on our values. And even when we have questions after that, we then take very specific options to a group of uh, stakeholders um, who are invested in this process. And that comes to mind for me with this question because I think that there's opportunities to, to ask around, like, how does this make you feel? If, if I use this, this, this color palette, or if I use this shape, or like, how does this make you feel? And so I, I would say replicate that process that we've, that model that we've applied to the design of the, the physical building, to the design of the program, to the design of the staffing makeup. Um, I think that those with lived experience in your networks um, and, uh, are, are going to provide some useful information for you. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's where my mind went. That's great. Yes, I think so. Thank you, Krista. Yep. All right. Next um, question about, see, you mentioned artists will be selected on their ability to demonstrate originality of vision. I'm assuming this is in regards to their past projects and work. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Again, we are not looking for proposals at this stage. Um, can you clarify that further about the proposals? The original call I saw made it seem uh, like a full-fledged artwork mock-up was required, but now I'm seeing that it is more just the concept. Right. 
Um, will there be time and compensation to refine the final design? Yes, yes, that will be part of the process, yes. Uh, would a video be counted? Um, uh, the, let me start over. <laughs> would a video be counted as one image or equal to all eight? Oh, that's a great question. Um, if one is uploading uh, in, or if one is showcasing in the video several pieces, and that's explained in the, the conceptual information field or acknowledging it, then I think that's fine too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you speak more, sorry, my tongue. Can you speak more to how the images provide, provided in the application and the artist's larger body of work would be considered? For example, if the images Sub submitted don't necessarily represent the majority of the artist's portfolio. Yes, read that to me one more time. <laughs> can you speak <laughs> more <laughs> about, or sorry, can you speak more to how the images provided in the application and the artist's larger body of work would be considered? How would the images be considered? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, uh, incumbent on the artist to to ultimately help us help communicate that. Um, so you know, I if a, if an artist is saying that you know, I, again, I'm gonna just use something really basic. I'm 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 also realizing my own bandwidth for the day is like ah, but. Um, if an artist is saying like, I do work in cool colors, that's like primarily what I do and I do landscapes, but then like submits imagery that has like warm hues and is like abstract, you know, that obviously is not right. There's, that's not congruent. So I guess what you're, what one artist is saying in the statement of interest, how does that, um, how do their past work samples support and reinforce what they're saying. I think that's really key. And I, I, I can't do that work for an artist, like, like that's up to them, but just thinking about that when they're making decisions on what to upload and um, insert an application. Okay. Um, as painter, photographer, and graphic digital artist, could I submit paintings, photos, and digital work samples? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. One more at the bottom here. Get there. Is there an opportunity to engage with people who might inhabit the space, uh, staff, visitors, residents, and include them in the collaborative design and creation, or at least a conversation about what they want? Uh, can the process of the design be participatory? and uh, collaboration with future community at the BHRC? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Chris and I were just talking about that this morning, actually. Um, so I would say, uh, according to our conversation this morning, we are trying to figure out what um, an engagement plan can look like. Um, I will also say that we, because the building is opening up in October, November, we also are on a timeline too. So I think part of what's gonna inform that uh, engagement process will be contingent on how, how we are keeping along with the timeline and also um, what I think uh, both the county and RAC staff can do before the artist comes on board. Um, but all that to say, we are hoping, yes, we are hoping that there will be some engagement. What that exactly looks like, I do not know yet. We're in the midst of figuring that out now. Right. Um, let's see, there's one more in the chat here. How will the panel evaluate portfolios specifically? So I'm assuming that means how is the panel gonna go through all of the applications and make their evaluation? Yeah, well, we will be doing it in a few rounds. Um, there will be an individual scoring round online that the panel will partake in. Um, 
and that they'll just go through all of the applications and uh, designate scores. Uh, I will, along with Danielle, take a look at those um, scores and then we will begin to uh, move certain applications into the second round, depending on what the scoring is. Um, and then that's that will be part of the conversation the panel will have collectively. Um, yeah, before we get to um, our semifinalists, which I um, usually we bring them in for interviews. Um, so yeah. And then I think the other part of that too is um, they're wondering how it will be evaluated like digital art or technical proficiency, creativity and intent, demonstration of classical knowledge, um, et cetera. Like is the panel looking at those? Are there things like that they're looking at specifically? Um, I think is what the question is. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that can really be well um, represented in what is um, what the artist uploads as their past work samples. So yes, they will be. Um, but again, I would say this is your opportunity to make use of the statement of interest and in those conceptual information fields. Like if there's like there's stuff that you're like, I really want the panel to know this, then please utilize that and um, let that be your first opportunity to share that with the with the panel, so. All right, well, that does it. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. If you have some, please, please feel free to put more questions in there. Yeah, and you can always email um, myself, esmeoral at racc.org. Um, I am communicating quite frequently with the county team. So if there's something I can answer, I can always share back with them to get a response. Um, but yeah, I, I just really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you all the attendees. Thank you, Krista, Lynn, um, our interpreters, Rachel and Janice. I hope I said that right. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for being, of course, Danielle, for facilitating. We are really excited that this work is coming to, um, to light and we're moving along in the process. And um, yeah, let, if again, any questions, feel free to reach out. We are here to help. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Well, enjoy your, I mean, we did it, 6.58, two minutes yeah. under. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, folks. Good night.